So, we're going to talk about an article published by John Rawls in 1958 called Justice as Fairness. Now, this is a little bit confusing because the phrase justice as fairness crops up all the time in works of Rawls. For example, uh, there's a famous 1980s um, article by Rawls called Justice as Fairness, colon, political, not metaphysical. And that's probably nowadays much more discussed than this one. And there's also a book published, I want to say around 2000, uh, just before Rawls' death, um, that was, uh, that's called Justice as Fairness, A Briefer Restatement, which is a hell of a lot longer than this article. So it seems a little odd that a briefer restatement would be much longer than the original article. But the reason why this original article uh, is probably less discussed um, than those others is that the ideas that Rawls lays down pretty much for the first time in this article are massively reworked and expanded in what is generally considered to be not just his masterpiece, but one of the great works of political philosophy ever, and certainly the greatest in the English-speaking world in the 20th century, which is A Theory of Justice, uh, published in 1971, which is a hefty tome. And if you think this article is heavy going, boy, this is a breeze in comparison with A Theory of Justice, and in fact, most of Rawls' work. Uh, so why look at this article? Well, because I wanted um, everybody to get a taste of political philosophy. And if you're talking about political philosophy in the 20th century, you have to talk about Rawls, particularly if you're talking analytic political philosophy. His one rival, probably in significance, uh, would be Habermas, um, who is uh, more discussed in continental philosophy. Although Rawls and Habermas actually uh, met and um, had a sort of an exchange. Um, but John Rawls, yes, certainly the most discussed political philosopher of the 20th century. If you look up the literature on Rawls, it is voluminous. Uh, so a couple of things about Rawls himself. Um, I think a, an interesting contrast with Rawls would be Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein has this image of the genius philosopher, just, you know, people who were around him said that, you know, the, the sort of geniusness of him came off him in waves and he had this frown and concentration and, you know, wouldn't suffer fools gladly. And he inspired almost cult-like devotion uh, in his students. Um, famous students of his include uh, Elizabeth Anscombe, Peter Geech, and Norman Malcolm, who actually was a, an early influence on Rawls. Um, but, uh, so, you know, uh, Raw, uh, Wittgenstein attracted these devoted followers who sort of went forth into the world. Rawls couldn't be more different personally. Uh, a small, quiet man, uh, very modest to a fault, just incredibly modest, very, uh, basically, an angel, you know, a saintly individual. And he sort of inspired devotion, and he absolutely did inspire devotion in his students by just being a wonderful person. By all accounts, there is nobody who has a bad word to say about Rawls the person. Uh, I went to a graduate school where initially two of the faculty were students of Rawls, Barbara Herman and Sharon Lloyd. Barbara Herman uh, disappeared off to UCLA shortly after my arrival. Um, and, and it's actually kind of interesting that their areas of study sort of marked what Rawls was interested in at the time they were students of his at Harvard. Um, so for example, Barbara Herman uh, is an expert on Kant's moral philosophy. And that was what Rawls was sort of getting into after the uh, the publication of um, A Theory of Justice and 
after the sort of brief, brief flurry of exchanges about, well, it wasn't that brief, but the flurry of exchanges about, uh, about theory of justice, he sort of um, focused on history of ethics and, uh, and in particular worked on Kant. And uh, this influenced uh, students of his like uh, Nora O'Neill, who is British, and um, Barbara Herman and Christine Corscard, who are, are American. Um, whereas Sharon Lloyd, uh, who was my dissertation advisor, um, she came a little bit later, at which point Rawls was, was getting back into political philosophy uh, prior to the big second wave of his thinking, which uh, uh, the, the major work of this is a book called Political Liberalism, published in the 90s, uh, which is sort of a reworking of a lot of the ideas, uh, a resetting of a lot of the ideas of uh, political, uh, of um, a theory of justice, largely in response to a wave of criticism from thinkers called communitarians. And in general, um, uh, Rawls, Rawls, his special genius, yes, uh, continuing the contrast with Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein is sort of flashy and, you know, y you can see him sort of thinking in real time by all accounts and uh, very short-tempered, would talk over people. Rawls, you wouldn't know he was a philosopher, really, just to look at him. He uh, was a very, you know, unexceptional looking person, uh, very quiet. And indeed, his, the history of his education uh, sort of pointed to a very, very intelligent but not genius level person, you know, hardworking, kind of plodding. But Rawls certainly was a genius, and his genius was at system building. That is, he, uh, he could look at the history of ideas and sort of absorb key points out of a, a bewildering profusion of sources and sort of filter them out and build them, build what he took to be the, the key insights of a diverse range of thinkers uh, into this system that he produced and that was his life's work. He, uh, he was a systematic thinker. He wasn't somebody who says, now I'll, I'll publish an article on this, now I'll publish an article on that. Uh, a, classic a couple of classic examples of this are uh, Thomas Nagel, um, who wrote a series of articles uh, uh, on, each, uh, on various different spheres, each one of which sort of exploded in the, the, uh, that sphere of study. We looked at one called, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? But he wrote on death and, um, and moral luck and other things like that. And uh, the, uh, another figure who's much more flashy and uh, uh, sort of publishes in a huge range of areas is Robert Nozick. And Robert Nozick, if you ever come across Rawls in an introductory textbook, it will be paired with Robert Nozick because Rawls published his magnum opus, um, Theory of Justice, that is the product of uh, over a decade of solid thinking and work. And very shortly thereafter, Robert Nozick slapped together something called Anarchy, State and Utopia, which is, let's be honest, a hell of a lot more of a fun read than Theory of Justice, and um, was seen as kind of a devastating criticism of Theory of Justice, and it's kind of presented as that when you get them paired together. So in the sort of early 70s, Nozick was seen as a big rival to Rawls. Not so much anymore. Um, Nozick's, uh, Nozick had this kind of um, pattern of uh, writing something that was considered uh, amazingly um, innovative on a, on a topic, but then getting bored of it very quickly and just moving on. And he, he I essentially never returned to political philosophy. And his ideas are beloved of libertarians, but uh, are not nowadays generally considered to present anything of a rivalry to Rawls. Um, 
Okay, what can we say about justice as fairness? Well, as I said, uh, it's worth looking at this article, even though um, actually this article is pretty much ignored in the literature because it's seen as basically uh, redundant once you get theory of justice. Because, as I said, Rawls sees his theory as sort of his life's work. And the, the other thing about Rawls is he is very critical of his own work. And he takes very seriously the criticisms of others. So when he presents ideas, they're always seen as sort of, what about this, sort of first drafts. And then he sees responses and takes what he thinks is right about the responses and tinkers with his ideas. If you, uh, you can kind of think of his theory as, uh, well, like Otto Neurath's uh, ship, that we are on, we're on sail on the ship, but it keeps getting damaged and we keep having to rebuild it. But, so Rawls has these key ideas, and the essence of the key ideas remains throughout, but they keep getting set in new contexts. So in this work, um, you see the first uh, version, the first draft of what in uh, theory of justice is called the original position. And this is perhaps the most famous idea of Rawls's. Uh, but it is not fully developed in justice as fairness. But nonetheless, I think justice as fairness is very worthwhile to read first because it focuses uh, like a laser on the notion of justice and uh, the contrast with utilitarianism, which, again, utilitarianism in the 20th century, certainly the first half, is seen as the big theory that if you're not going to agree with it, you have to take it down. You have to offer serious criticisms because it's sort of the default position in the Anglo-American um, uh, philosophical school, that the, the, the sort of knee-jerk assumption is that some version of utilitarianism is going to emerge as the winner in, you know, uh, the theory of ethics and morality. Uh, perhaps the best um, version of utilitarianism uh, in the early 20th century is by Henry Sidgwick, uh, as presented in Me Method of Ethics. And Rawls is very much steeped in Sidgwick. Sidgwick's work is considered to be uh, a masterpiece, although um, my, uh, my undergraduate, one of my undergraduate professors, Roger Crisp, uh, said that he believed that Henry Sidgwick made it intentionally boring because one of Sidgwick, Sidgwick's uh, theses is that the justification of ethics shouldn't necessarily be known by the general population. So when he presents his, his, his theory, he makes the book incredibly boring so that nobody, the general public won't read it and won't know about it. Now that's kind of a joke, but it gives you some idea that the method of ethics is kind of a slog. Well, Rawls' Rules, theory of justice is also kind of a slog. But I think the reason Rawls can be so forbidding to get into is because of this genius for, um, taking the overall view. He is aware of how everything fits together and he can't tell you it all at once, but everything fits with everything else in this big theory he's got in his head and it's at a high level of abstraction. One of the things that Nozick is genius at and that Rawls just doesn't do to much, uh, to any great extent, is offer examples. An exception, and that's why this is a nice um, article to begin with, is the slavery case study in section 7 of this article. Uh, talking about slavery is about as uh, specific as Rawls ever gets. Uh, because of his goal for his theory of being a very general theory of justice. Now this is qualified in later works. Um, it is not a theory of justice for all societies at any time. Um, 
it pretty quickly gets qualified as a theory of justice for sort of modern uh, democratic societies. Um, but that, this is already sort of hinted at in this article. Uh, it's never going to be a theory of justice for uh, societies in extremes, that is, in great scarcity or in anything, uh, or, um, or in either in great scarcity or no scarcity at all. One of the insights that uh, Rawls takes from Hume is the circumstances of justice. And um, for justice to be an issue, you have to be sort of in the middle between uh, the two extremes of extreme scarcity and no scarcity. The only sense, uh, th there's no need for justice in heaven. But because, you know, everything is taken care of and there's no, uh, there's no squabbles over resources. There's no competing claims to resources. So th that's one feature of the concept of justice that will mean that a theory of justice sort of applies not to all possible arrangements of, of humans. Okay, so um, it, yeah, he does actually ruefully say uh, at, towards the end of section, uh, it's either five or six, you know, uh, up to this point, um, it's all been rather abstract. Well, yes, Rawls, that is the, pretty much the history of your writing. But um, when you're first getting into it, this can be exasperating and reading theory of justice can be exhausting and he, he seems to repeat himself and there's so much of it. But uh, you just have to sort of immerse yourself in Rawls. And when you do, it sort of seeps into your bones and you, uh, you start talking in the jargon that Rawls uses. Rawls is, there, sh there could be an entire dictionary. Uh, Rawls is like Marx in this respect. Another systematic, uh, a great systematic thinker in that um, he has all of these sort of portentous phrases like the original position or overlapping consensus is one from his later work and things like this. Uh, and they're shorthand as they have to be for all of these ideas that fit together in, in kind of a massive web. All right, so uh, let's plunge in. The introductory section um, makes it clear that what he's going to talk about in this article is uh, a kind of narrow no narrower notion of justice than you might find in the history of, um, of philosophy. Um, a critic of Rawls is the uh, Canadian philosopher G. A. Cohen, um, whose famous work is a defense of Karl Marx's history of uh, uh, philosophy of history, and he's, uh, Cohen was, uh, was of a group that was um, famous in the 70s and 80s called the analytical Marxist. So he, was, he, is, uh, he is a critic of Rawls, but he said of Rawls that the theory of justice was, if there were any works of philosophy that were greater than it, it would just be Plato's Republic and Hobbes's Leviathan, which, which is exalted company. Those are considered just masterpieces of political philosophy. And in Plato's Republic, it is, if it's about one thing, Plato's Republic is about justice. But the way the Greeks talk about justice, as we've seen in Philip Foote's article, is as a virtue that can be applied to humans, to individual humans, just as, as much as it can be applied to societies. And the analogy in Plato's Republic is between justice within an individual human and justice within the city. So what Rawls is saying is, I'm not going to be talking about justice as a virtue of individuals. I'm just focusing on justice as a feature of societies. Um, this gets more complicated uh, as in theory of justice. He, he, he is talking about justice in the basic structure of a society. And the basic structure is the way certain institutions, which include 
theoretical institutions, the institution of property, as well as legal systems and the family, all of these institutions that are part of uh, a society. Justice, uh, his theory of justice is sort of uh, applied to the interrelationship, the setup of all of these institutions, not necessarily within each of those institutions. So, for example, uh, a feminist criticism of Rawls was that Rawls does not apply his theory of justice within a family. He doesn't demand that a family be organized according to the principles of justice. Um, families can be organized according to quite illiberal um, principles, and that's consistent with his theory. Uh, and this was criticized um, by uh, various thinkers, for example, Susan Muller Oaken. Okay, so introduction tells you what justice is. It's, um, I shall focus on the usual sense of justice in which it is essentially the elimination of arbitrary distinctions and the establishment within the structure of a practice, here he's using the Wittgensteinian term, probably because he's under the influence of Norman Malcolm at the time, uh, within the structure of a practice of a proper balance between competing claims. All right, so that's what he's going to talk about. Um, what's he going to say about it? Well, in section two, we get his conception of justice. Okay, in section eight, he distinguishes between the concept of justice, what justice is, and conceptions of justice, which are uh, what, how you would flesh out justice in particular circumstances. So this is his conception of justice. This is, it's a bit like uh, the distinction between what ethics is. Uh, a utilitarian can tell you what ethics is, and then they can tell you their view of what constitutes right and wrong, which would be utilitarian. But Ethics itself is neither utilitarian or, or deontological, it's just an area of study. So justice as a concept is what justice is, and then here's what he thinks uh, would realize justice. So he plunges right in and he gives you these two principles. Now, again, these two principles are not the same here as they are in theory of justice. Theory of justice, I don't think he changes them after theory of justice. Uh, but certainly they're not the same as here. But I'll read them out, they're on page 165. Uh, first, each person participating in a practice or affected by it has an equal right to the most extensive liberty compatible with a like liberty for all. S um, so this is sometimes called the liberty principle um, later on. Now, the difference that he makes in theory of justice is whereas here he talks about liberty singular, in theory of justice he talks about liberties uh, and focuses on specific ones. So here it's as if liberty is a mass noun that you can, that you can have more or less of. And I think uh, critics pointed out that this was, this was an odd idea and uh, later on he talked it in terms of liberties which can include certain basic rights. So this is sort of, uh, this includes uh, rights, uh, rights that give you, um, that determine your freedom within a certain sp sphere, determine and protect your freedom within a certain sphere. So like liberty of conscience, liberty of uh, speech and so on. We, so the basic idea is uh, we want to ensure that um, we have the largest amount of freedoms, each person has the largest amount of freedoms that is compatible with the same amount for others. So in other words, uh, something would violate this if some people had freedoms that infringed on the freedoms of others. So if I had the freedom to eat anybody I could overpower, clearly this would infringe on their freedom not to be eaten. So that would be ruled out by this principle. Second, inequalities are arbitrary, that is, you know, unjustifiable, 
uh, unless it is reasonable to expect that they will work out to everyone's advantage and provided the positions and offices to which they attach or from which they may be gained are open to all. This, is an, this also undergoes changes uh, in theory of justice. In theory of justice uh, and thereafter, it is referred to as the difference principle. The main change is, um, here it says, inequalities are arbitrary unless it is reasonable to expect that they will work out for everyone's advantage. Now, there's something paradoxical about this on the face of it. It says, how can inequalities work out to everyone's advantage? Well, he quickly illustrates this. He says, like, uh, he illustrates this with a, a, um, an example of a game. He says, um, and, and you should be glad of this because it's an example and they're rare as diamonds in rules. Players in a game do not protest against there being different positions, such as batter, pitcher, catcher, and the like, nor there being various privileges and powers as specified to the rules, according to the rules. Often critics of egalitarianism um, treat egalitarians, of which rules is one, as committed to sameness across the board. Um, you know, uh, that uh, if everyone is the same, it somehow saps the, something wonderful from human life. Rawls is absolutely not uh, arguing for this. He is saying you can have difference, you can have differences, um, but if there are differences, first of all, the differences must be open to all. So as he says, nobody objects to there being uh, different uh, positions in a, a game. His example is baseball. He loved baseball. Um, so long as they're open to all. Obviously, there would be an objection if only, you know, children of uh, the aristocracy got to be batters and everybody else had to be fielders or something like that. That would violate this principle, which includes being open to all. But the fact that being a batter is different, unequal from being a fielder or being a pitcher, is not an inequality that uh, is unjustifiable. Uh, in fact, it is justifiable so long as having the, these differences works to the advantage of all. And here he is kind of non-committal about a capitalist idea, which is incentives. So the um, why is it that uh, should, should surgeons be paid more? And Rawls says, possibly. It is perfectly possible that having surgeons be paid more is consistent with this principle. Because if it, it turns out to have the effect of attracting the best surgeons, and this is good for a society because they have the best people as surgeons, then that's the, and, and everybody's welfare is lifted up. Everyone in the society that has this inequality is better off than people uh, in a society that is dead equal, then this kind of inequality is justified. It would be irrational to prefer equal, equality that brought the general level of um, welfare lower. So, inequalities can be justified so long as they're to everyone's advantage. Now, what does that mean, everyone's? In the, uh, in the version of this principle that he uh, arrived at in Theory of Justice, he changes this so it doesn't say to everyone's advantage, it's to the advantage of the least well-off. Because he says, if we're raising the level of welfare of those at the bottom in society, this will be the important thing. So long as, so the way you judge society, the, whether or not this is a good inequality, is if the worst off in your society are better off with this inequality than they would be in a state of equality. So that's sort of the idea there of the difference principle. Now, before I go on, it's worth saying a little bit about um, how these two principles are a good indication of 
Rawls' innovation. He's taking insights from competing camps in uh, political and moral thinking. And he's saying that both of them are valuable. So the liberty principle uh, is sort of uh, taking the insight of the deontological rights-based thinkers that, um, you know, there's something fundamental about human rights, that uh, the individual is paramount and you can't sacrifice the individual for the good of the society. But um, if you just have a theory committed to this idea, uh, as for example libertarians do, it can lead to societies of massive inequality. It can lead to, you know, societies like the current United States and worse, where there's massive inequalities um, and general misery for the vast majority of the population. The difference principle uh, appeals to general welfare, um, like, for example, utilitarianism does. Uh, that is, that uh, utilitarians, of course, say that the, the right uh, society, a society that uh, is the right organization, would be one where the, lev the general level of uh, happiness. Uh, you know, the quantity of happiness in classic utilitarianism is greater than the alternatives. Um, so Rawls is trying to take these insights and uh, get them to work together. Uh, in this respect, uh, another uh, analogy I like to give for Rawls is he's, he's a bit like Aristotle. He's not like Plato. Even though um, Cohen compared uh, theory of justice with the Republic, um, Plato is somebody whose ideas um, seem to be very distinctive and very much um, his own. Aristotle, uh, was, his, his methodology was to go through all of the thinkers before him and sort of hold them up and say, well, there's something right about this, but th it's wrong in this respect. Let's take the good bit and incorporate it in our theory and uh, do the same for everything. And that's essentially what Rawls did. He was uh, famous as a um, lecturer on the greats of moral philosophy and political philosophy. Uh, his lectures, in fact, have been published. That was one of the things that was published uh, shortly after his death was um, a volume of lectures on moral philosophy, on Kant and Hume and so on, and on political philosophy, uh, in particular the social contract theorists. Um, and he does think, uh, just as he worked on his own theory, tinkered with it, uh, and sort of made changes throughout his life, it's as if the theory of justice is one that has been sort of passed down through all the great minds of the ages and they've all contributed something and Rawls rather modestly is forever saying look none of this is a new idea. Rawls never claims here's my great innovation. Someone like Popper for example likes to say that like his uh, falsificationist. Popper was very insistent that was his idea. Whereas Rawls never says that. He says uh, you know you can see that uh, when he introduces the uh, two principles. He says, look, these aren't my ideas. These are uh, old ideas. You can see them in this, this, and this. You know, his footnotes are full of references to uh, where other places where the ideas come from. But make no mistake, the setting that he puts them in is his own construction, and that's his particular genius. Okay. Um, so here he says uh, something, uh, there's a comment that I think is uh, very important, where he says these two principles uh, evidence the fact that justice, justice, this concept that we're analyzing, is a complex of liberty, equality, and um, because it's a, a virtue of social institutions, it's going to involve 
what so societies produce and your fair share of what society produces. So it's very key that it's justice as a virtue of social institutions because part of what justice is about is settling the slice of the pie. We all um, get reward from existing in a society. This is something that libertarians forget that, uh, and you know, selfish free riders are always forgetting that the very fact of living a social existence gives you stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise. And you have to acknowledge that and you have to acknowledge that because you benefit, you have to contribute um, and you have to expect that others should be able to benefit too because you benefit from them being part of society. Uh, this is something that is built into his conception of uh, justice. Okay, now it's a little weird that uh, Rawls first introduces his um, principles and then he introduced um, sort of, well it's not really the justification for them, but it's an explanation for why, or it, yeah, it is a justification, it's saying here's why I think I can commit myself to these principles because they're the ones that would result from this procedure. Normally, it's the other way around. You, you say, uh, here's the procedure and let's see what it comes up with. Now, why does he do it this way round? Well, probably because um, he doesn't want to suggest that uh, his principles are, first of all, the be-all and end-all. As always with Rawls, he says, look, this is just, I'm not saying these are carved on tablets of stone brought down from the mountain. This is just a, I, I think this captures some key ideas. It's not the end point of history. Maybe a better conception can come up with. This is the best one I've come up with. I've thought hard about this. Maybe you can come up with a better one. But I think this is best and better than the others. So it's not like he thinks that you can design a decision procedure and then let it run and here's what it will come up with. It's like you build a computer to, and tell it, come up with a theory of justice and this would come out. So he's not arguing that. He's just saying that of the major, I, I just want to say this is a contender. He says we have these other contenders like the utilitarian theory. They offer an account of justice. It's what justice is a, is a society a society exhibits justice if it's organized according to utilitarian principles. All right, that's your contender. Here's my contender. Now, I'm going to say the correct method for choosing principles of justice, given what justice is, will meet this description. And this is why section three is probably the most important. Uh, and it's the proto version of what in theory of justice is called the original position. Here, he doesn't really call it anything. Uh, I, I think he refers to it as the general position. But uh, in theory of justice, this is the original uh, position. So, and the description of the general position starts on the last line of page 169, where he says, Imagine a society of persons among whom a certain system of practices is already well established. Now suppose by and large they are mutually self-interested. So, um, yeah, step back. The way he, it works is uh, he describes a set of individuals which for, uh, are perennially referred to as the parties. The parties to what? Well, the parties to Rawls' version of the social contract. So, what, uh, one of the great things that Rawls does in Theory of Justice, and, and we already see it in, in this article, is he revitalizes uh, the theory of the social contract, which has a very long history in political philosophy. 
and it was, at the time he was writing, kind of moribund, largely because of utilitarian criticisms of it and proto-utilitarian criticisms. The most famous criticisms in political philosophy of the theory of the social contract are given by uh, David Hume who is regarded as a proto-utilitarian. His, his theory is, uh, is like an early version of utilitarianism. Um, so, a few words about the social contract. The uh, great social contract theorists are, although he's not the first, he is perhaps the greatest, is Hobbes, uh, that's what Leviathan is. Leviathan is, uh, well, it's a lot of things, but it includes his uh, theory of the social contract. Then Locke, who uses the social contract to come up with a very different conclusion from Hobbes. Rousseau, who wrote a book called On the Social Contract. Uh, and to a lesser extent, because he didn't write that much about it, although it's probably the most influential on Rawls, Kant, Immanuel Kant. These are social contract theorists. Now, Rawls has a very particular interpretation of every single one of these that is perhaps not the traditional interpretation. Um, but the basic idea of a social contract theory is that, um, well, first of all, why would you even have a social contract theory? Answer. If you want to justify political institutions that um, arrange power unequally, given a starting point of equality. So, what, what does all that mean? Locke, in particular, was, took as his target of his political philosophy, which essentially which was unbelievably influential on the framers of the American Constitution. Basically, you have Locke to thank for, uh, for huge features of your Constitution. You Americans, well, me too. Um, the divine right of kings is the idea that power is naturally unequal, that certain people are naturally born to rule. Um, why? Because God grants them, uh, because they're, dis they're descendants from the oldest male line from Adam or something like that. So uh, Locke is attacking a particular version of the theory by a guy called Filmer. Um, uh, in particular, he does this in his first treatise, although uh, Locke's second treatise is the one that everybody reads nowadays, which is his social contract theory. Anyway, so the divine right of kings says, uh, you know, the, the king rules because, duh, he's the king and he is unequal to you. If, on the other hand, you believe, as in the, uh, the, the American founding documents, that people are born equal, that there is no such thing as natural political inequality. So if you reject natural political inequality, then you have a puzzle explaining how the uh, how you can justify political inequality um, that we see in societies. Do we have to say, now if you're an anarchist, you would just say, oh, well, you can't justify it. People are naturally equal, therefore we shouldn't have societies um, because any society is going to set up uh, people in charge and um, we can't have that. So unless you're going to be an anarchist, you you have to justify how we can arrive at inequality from an initial beginning uh, uh, of equality. And the social contract is the, the attempted solution to this idea, is to say inequalities are fine so long as they're agreed to by the people that, um, that are part of this society. So nobody can complain about the rules of a society and the, the offices and the inequalities of a society if they agreed to it. And um, so, uh, the obvious criticism of this idea, 
and Hume gives a couple of versions of this, is first of all, wait a minute. Are you saying that the society we're in, if, this is going to, if there's going to be a point to the social contract theory, it has to work on actual societies. So are you saying that this society that we're living in is the inequalities are justified, the, the political inequalities, we're not talking about economic inequalities right now, we're talking about political inequalities. Are you saying that the political inequalities are justified because people in the past agreed to them? Who cares about that? Why should the agreement of the people in the past bind me today? So that's one criticism. Um, now, in response to this, Rawls says, it's very clear, I don't think, uh, well Rawls says actually that uh, the classic social contract theorists weren't really saying that. I think this is hard to argue with someone like Locke. Locke uses a lot of historical language, but certainly that's uh, uh, Rawls' view, that uh, actually even the great social contract theorists didn't really mean that it was uh, a a historical event, that it was a bunch of people, like a club. You know, a club is, uh, the founding of a club is a historical event. The initial founders set up the rules and then they follow the rules because otherwise they didn't have to join the society. That's the other part of Hume's criticism is, okay, the social contract kind of makes sense if uh, members of a club have to follow the rules because they didn't have to join the club. So if they're in the club, it's their own fault, and so we can understand why they have to follow the rules. But, says Hume, and this is, I think, his, his most fundamental insight, societies aren't like that. Uh, he says he might just as well say to some poor farmer, well, you didn't have to join this society, and given that you're in it, you should follow the rules. That's like saying to someone that you kidnap and put on a ship uh, and say, well, now you have to work on the ship. That's like saying to them, well, if you don't like it, you can leave. Because, of course, they can't leave. They'll drown. And the poor farmer can't leave because he, he was born here. He can't do anything about it. So the social contract model uh, under Hume's criticism is unfair. Rawls takes all of this into account. Okay, why is he interested in the social contract? Because the virtue of the social contract is that it justifies uh, arrangements or it justifies yeah, the, the arrangements of, the, of society to each individual person. And it says that if uh, the, the arrangements of the society uh, via the principles of justice, if they cannot be justified to each individual person, then we can't have them. So essentially, it says, uh, just his theory of justice, because it uses the social contract, is profoundly uh, democratic. It's saying we check in on everybody in the society, as it were. Do you all sign on to this? So nobody, and, and, and Rawls says, if you don't do this, then um, inflicting rules on somebody who has not, in some sense, consented to the rules, is just coercion. You're just forcing them against their will. So it's only if some version of the social contract works that we can ever justify uh, political arrangements, given what we all agree, that basically humans are free and equal. So, given that we have rejected this idea that some people are born to rule and some people are born to be ruled, we reject that. We say everybody's free and equal. Okay, if we're going to uh, really commit to that, then the only kind of justification that is going to work is a version of the social contract. But it has to be a version that avoids the famous criticisms. And Rawls thinks he can do that with his recasting of the social contract. So, basically, um, he says, uh, on page 170, we see his description of the parties to the contract. So, who are these parties to the contract? Well, think of it this way. Uh, here's the version, here's a very, very childish 
um, explanation of the version in Theory of Justice, the original position. Imagine souls in heaven, like in the, uh, if you've seen the movie uh, Soul, the Pixar movie, where you have all these little blue blobs that don't have any personality uh, or features, and they're waiting to be embodied. Remember, 22 is the one vo voiced by Tina Fey who resists this. But anyway, the, uh, the parties to the original position are like that. And their job is to come up with uh, principles of justice. Now, originally Rawls says come up with, but uh, once we realize how little information the people in the original position have to go on, they can't construct them from scratch. So he, he modifies that and he says, well, all right, which principles of justice would they pick from a list? Um, well, what would they, uh, what, what is true about these, uh, these little blue blobs existing in a sort of pre-earthly existence? So they've got to, their job in their pre-earthly existence is to pick out principles of justice that will organize the society that they're then going to be embodied in. Now, what can we say about these little blue blobs? First of all, they are mutually self-interested. That is, they want what's best for themselves. But the catch is, they don't know what themselves are because they don't have a self yet. They don't know what race they're going to be. They don't know what gender they're going to be. They don't know what sexuality they're going to be. They don't know if they're disabled or not. They don't know any of that. So, not knowing any of that, they've still got to come up with a system that will be best for them. Why? Because they're, they're self-interested. They want to do what's best for them. Um, now, uh, in response to criticisms, in uh, Theory of Justice, he talks as if uh, they really are the same people. The people in the original position are the same people that are going to be in society. Later on, he modifies it and he says that the parties in the original position are representatives. So it's as if uh, the little blue blob is like the agent, you know, like a sports agent or a theatrical agent representing the interests of a citizen, but they don't know anything about the citizen. Why don't they know anything about the citizen? They are behind, and here's one of Rawls's famous phrases, the veil of ignorance. This is an idea that you don't find in this article that he, uh, that is an improvement that he comes up with later. Uh, the veil of ignorance says that they don't know facts about themselves. Why don't they know facts about themselves? And the answer is because if they did know facts about themselves, if they did know, oh, I'm going to be male, uh, Caucasian, non-disabled, oh, I'm going to rig the game in favor of males, Caucasians, non-disabled people. So that would allow them, and, and you know, they would be incentivized to do that because they are self-interested. That would allow them to rig the game. We want to avoid rigging the game. We want a game. This is why it's fairness. We want them to come up with uh, a, uh, a system that is fair. Now, um, before I flesh out a bit more about, well, so the parties are described as self-interested, rational, that is, uh, you know, they, they won't make stupid bets or anything. They'll be cautious and rational in the sense of prudent. They, they will really do what's best for themselves. They won't be overtaken by, uh, you know, gambles or, you know, uh, they won't be motivated by things like hatred or anything like that. They're, they're, they'll be very cautious, acting kind of like, uh, rope, you know, what a computer would, you might say. Um, and here's a key point, he says, part of being rational is they won't be motivated by envy. In other words, they will be okay with the right kinds of inequalities. They won't say, oh, that person is better than me, I, uh, I can't have that. That kind of thing would lead to a society where everyone was equal, but they might be worse off than a society where we have inequalities 
and we're back to the example of the game, where you're, or surgeons being paid more. If you're envious, you might say, oh no, a surgeon can't be paid more than me in case I'm not a surgeon. Uh, that's being motivated by envy and that's irrational according to Rawls. So we'll take envy out of the, um, out of the picture. Everybody is assumed to have roughly similar needs and interests. Um, okay, so uh, the, par the description of the parties as self-interested, rational, and basically equal models the circumstances of justice. That is, um, these things are important because the circumstances of justice are where we're in a society where there's relative scarcity, not too much, not too little, so there will be a competition for resources. So the self-interestedness of the parties uh, models the fact that people are kind of in competition in the society. The procedure, which in the original position in theory of justice includes the veil of ignorance, models moral constraints. So this is obvious in the case of veil of ignorance. Why don't you know um, who you're going to be in this world that you're designing? Well, you're not designing the world down to a fine-grained detail. You're just coming up with uh, principles of justice that will govern the, the nitty-gritty of specific laws. These are not specific laws. These aren't even the Constitution. These are principles that will, uh, res will govern what kind of Constitution would be permissible. So they're at a very high level of general, uh, generality. Okay, the procedure models moral constraints. That is, they're going, uh, the way that this is designed is to ensure that we come up with um, whatever they choose, they will be fair. So basically, the, the original position is designed as a circumstance that everybody can agree that people, parties in this uh, uh, circumstance would choose fair principles. Another analogy is, suppose you want to ensure a fair slicing of a cake. Here is a way to design a procedure that would result in a fair slicing of a cake. Have the person who slices the cake choose the last piece. That person gets the last piece. If you say if that is your procedure for cake slicing, it will result in a very equal slicing of the cake. Why? Because the person slicing the cake wants the best for themselves, and the only way to ensure that is to ensure that all the pieces are the same. Um, this is exactly analogous to that. The way to ensure be what is best or most just for um, each individual in the society is to put the designers of this society in this situation where they can't rig it in their favor. Um, each will be wary of proposing a principle which would give him a peculiar advantage in his present circumstances, supposing it to be accepted. This is Rawls working his way. He, or, he hasn't quite come up with the idea of the veil of ignorance, but uh, he's hinting at it. Uh, and the analogy he gives on page 172, like the cake slicing, is he says, the restrictions um, which would so arise might be thought of as those a person might keep in mind if he were designing a practice in which his enemy were to assign him his place. If you knew that your enemy got to pick you your place, then you would make sure that all of the options were as good as possible. The worst option was as good as possible, because you know that's the one your enemy is going to give to you. That's the way to ensure fairness. And if everybody's involved in this, everybody can be equally committed and they can't complain, oh, I'm having these rules imposed on me, I didn't have a say. No, you do have a say, because in some sense you're one of the parties in the original position. In a way that I'll have to explain, because it's also true that the parties are not the citizens. So, the general position has two elements. There's a description of the parties, which I'm describing as like the blue blobs in Seoul, as being self-interested and so on. And there's a description of the circumstances in which they find them, uh, themselves. And each of these is supposed to model 
things that are important. Um, why should the parties be self-interested? Humans, well, humans, it's not that, uh, this is a, the, the point that we're, we're making here. Critics of rules might say, oh, you're just assuming that humans are evil and selfish because you're describing them as self-interested. And he said, no, look, the parties are not the same as the citizens. Now, this is a, a fine uh, tightrope to walk because the idea of the social contract is you're saying that um, the result of the social contract has to be agreed to by the citizens because they're party to it. And if you're saying the parties are not the citizens, then the people making the contract are not the people who are governed by the rules, but doesn't that destroy the whole point of what you're doing? Well, the parties are artificial sort of narrowings of, um, of the citizens. We're focusing on uh, their selfishness because uh, we're talking about justice and justice only arrives when there's competition. So if we didn't say that the parties were selfish, then we would just be seen as uh, unrealistic, as airy-fairy, as ignoring uh, a sad fact about humankind. But it's not as if we're saying that all humans are just motivated that way. They're not, and certainly in their private lives, people can be totally unselfish, and Rawls is, is absolutely um, insistent on that. So that's the sense in which the parties are not the citizens. Um, and that's one of the, the differences between the classic social contract theory and, uh, Raw and Rawls's theory. Um, so in section four, uh, Rawls is explaining how his version of the social contract theory isn't like uh, theories in the past that have been criticized. So the first one he uh, talks about is uh, the theory suggested by Glaucon at the beginning of book two of Plato's Republic. Where, and Glaucon uh, presents a challenge to Socrates in this work, where he's saying justice isn't your, uh, Socrates is arguing in the Republic that justice is one of the best types of good. It's good in itself uh, and it's good for the person who exhibits it. Whereas uh, Glaucon says, no, 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 no. It's not the best type of good. It's an unfortunate compromise. Uh, the worst thing that could happen to you is you get exploited. The best thing that could happen is that you are the exploiter. Um, justice lies in the middle. Because you're scared of being exploited, even though you secretly want to be an exploiter, you make an agreement with everybody else, I won't exploit you if you don't exploit me. So it's a kind of a, a compromise. Um, that's what justice is. Uh, really, you can do better than justice, uh, uh, according to this view. So it's not so great. Um, now, Socrates, uh, who is the mouthpiece of Plato in the Republic, comes up with a response to that. That's the point of the Republic. But uh, certainly that's a view of justice as sort of a, a modus vivendi, a compromise. Uh, and then there's the classic social contract theories like Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. Um, and he distinguishes his, himself from both of these. First of all, it's not the case that um, the Glaucon version makes it sound like uh, justice results from people, uh, from the actual citizens making kind of an agreement. I'll, I won't hurt you if you don't hurt me. And he says, well, look, uh, you're making it sound like everybody in the society secretly wants to exploit one another. Um, now, it might sound like that with my parties, but they're not the same as the citizens. They are artificial abstractions of the relevant features that, uh, that represent the circumstances of justice, where there's scarce resources and competition for them. Now, what uh, we're going to see the other side of that in section in what I've listed as number four here. Se uh, second point is it's not an actual contract. 
there is no, uh, there's what um, classic views or, or classic understandings of the social contract is the social contract is uh, an agreement between the people and uh, the ruler. Now, none of uh, the classic social contract theories that I've mentioned actually says this, uh, but that is a common, under common view that the, the, um, the people have agreed to appoint the ruler. So there's this pact between the people and the ruler. Um, that's not the case here. There's no actual agreement. There's no signing on the dotted line that happens in the general position. They're just choosing principles of justice. Um, third, it's not foundational because society already exists. This is an important point. Locke, in particular, spends a lot of time talking, well, actually, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau, although Rousseau, it happens more in another work called Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, talk about something called the state of nature. Now, libertarians love the idea of the state of nature. In fact, libertarians often refer to Locke's version of the state of nature. The state of nature is, in theory, um, a pre-social existence where humans are free of all government. It's kind of like an anarchy. So it's a time, because uh, political structures are human constructions, they're not natural. So what is natural? Equality and no laws and no uh, political bodies, no governments, just living without laws and governments. That's the state of nature. Well, say the classical social contract theories, what kind of society is justified has to be justified relative to this. If it was heavenly living in the state of nature, then no society would be justified. Or if the, you have to compromise something so important to, uh, to go into the state of nature, as for example, Rousseau sounds like he's saying in Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, then no society is worth it and we should have anarchy. But the various political theorists, depending on how they depict the state of nature, end up justifying different kinds of societies. Famously, Hobbes says, life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That is, state of nature is hell on earth. Uh, it's like, you know, the failed states that we point to in, um, in the world today. Uh, are they nice places to live? No. None of the libertarians who complain about our uh, oppressive laws and, you know, uh, COVID lockdowns want to go and live in, you know, the parts of Somalia that are free from governments, uh, oddly enough. So Hobbes says, because the state of nature is so appalling, then it, uh, the kind of society that is justified is actually a society that is least likely to slip into the state of nature. Hobbes was writing during the English Civil War when social unrest was a very much an issue. So he ends up justifying, uh, famously, a, a, a system where the sovereign has a great deal of power. Uh, the sovereign is not necessarily a king, though. It can be a, a body. But, um, but he ends up justifying uh, significant power in the, in the hands of um, the sovereign to ensure stability. Stability is all important because the state of nature is so horrific. Uh, Locke, on the other hand, makes the state of nature sound a lot better. So he ends up only justifying a fairly minimal state because we don't want to lose what was good about the state of nature. Uh, and so we end up with a kind of small government and uh, uh, significant freedoms, for example, to amass great wealth in, um, in a Lockean society. Uh, all of this is, you know, very surface level and you shouldn't take it as, uh, as a good summary of Locke or Hobbes, but basically they both talk about the state of nature. Um, so the parties to their uh, social contract in some sense are seen as 
people in the state of nature wanting to set up a society. So they're like the founding members of a club. The club doesn't exist until the agreement brings it into existence. So there's sort of a founding contract that establishes society. Rawls is very insistent that this is bullshit, uh, although he's far too polite to put it in those terms. He's, he uh, would agree with one thing that Aristotle says, that essentially we're social creatures. We don't live outside of society. There is no state of nature. That's a fiction. We've always lived in societies. We cannot function, really, outside of society. So we shouldn't think of the social contract as establishing society. Society just exists. So the social contract is not what brings society into existence. We are products of society. You can't even think of humans distinguished from society. A little bit ironic, given his uh, thought experiment of the parties, sort of isolated from society. But you can't even imagine human nature outside of society. We are shaped by our society. Our very natures and desires and wants are products of our society. So we're not going to, uh, you don't get anywhere talking about a state of nature. That's just a fiction. So there's no founding moment. What this is, and this leads us to point number four, uh, Rawls' interpretation of the classic social contracts is that there wasn't really, they don't really think there was a founding moment. So in that sense, the founding contract that they talk about is kind of a fiction. And Hume uh, is, it, it sort of criticizes them on this score, criticizes them uh, that it does sound fictional. Hume says, you know, are we really supposed to think that this is how society started? We know how societies start. They s start by one person bullying another and forcing them to, uh, to be under their power. There's no contract. So uh, Rawls says, if what the classic social contracts theorists were saying is that there was a founding moment, then yes, Hume would be right. Actually, I don't think they were saying that, so they're kind of immune to that. Uh, but in fact, what I interpret them as saying is that it's kind of a fiction. But you can criticize them for that. Um, there's a, a nice quote by the philosopher Greg Kafka. He said, uh, if, as Rawls interprets them, uh, the classic social contract theorists are, are, are not arguing for an actual contract, they're arguing for a hypothetical contract, he says, well, you can't be bound by a hypothetical contract. Hypothetical contracts, in his phrase, are not worth the paper they're not written on, um, which is a nice turn of phrase. Uh, but what Rawls is saying, OK, yes, but my social contract is not even fictional in this case. I'm not talking about a fictional uh, historical event. My social contract is something that the actual citizens can enter at any time. So here's where uh, you've got to distinguish between a sort of Kantian view of contracts and a kind of Lockean view of contracts. And Rawls is very much in the Kantian school. In a Lockean view of contracts, a contract is just a matter of agreement. And you can make a stupid contract and be bound by it. Hobbes is even more insistent on this. Hobbes can, says that you can basically uh, make an agreement that's really stupid and you're still bound by it. Although, you have to qualify that, but we're not talking about Hobbes now. Anyway, um, whereas Kantian's contract, it's not about an actual agreement, about saying the word, signing on the line. It's about going through a certain kind of pro uh, mental process. And that's essentially what Rawls is saying. Rawls' social contract is, uh, you can run this little experiment, the general position, at any point. Any member of a society can put themselves by, uh, 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 you know, closing their eyes and imagining it, as a party in the original position and think, what would I agree to? And therefore, because every member of the society can do that, in some sense, there's an actual contract. And the actual contract is them doing that. So it's not, there's not a problem that this happened in history and why does the agreement in history bind me. It's not a historical thing. And it's not a fiction. 
it's a hypothetical, but it's an actual hypothetical. It's an actual process that any one of us can go through at any time by just imagining. Um, so it's not fictitious, even though it is hypothetical. And even though the parties are not, are not the citizens, each citizen can be a party by putting themselves in this situation. So it's sort of uh, an ongoing way to test one's society. Is my society governed by principles of justice that I, when I put myself into the circumstances of fairness, because that's why the uh, original position is designed that way, uh, would come up with? <sighs> you see what I mean? We're all, it's all, you know, it's all tied together. All right. I'm running out of time. I don't want this to drag on to two hours. So, the duty and sense of fair play. Rawls uh, says in this section, he defends this notion. And here uh, we might be reminded of um, W.D. Ross's discussion of prima facie duties, that there are these various, there is a plurality of uh, moral duties that cannot be reduced into each other. And Rawls adds to this list the duty of fair play, which is accomplished, accompanied by a sense of fair play. So he argues in this section that we have, um, that we have a, uh, everybody agrees that we have this sense that there is a duty to abide by fair rules, even when doing so goes against one's immediate self-interest. So th there's a couple of nice passages at the bottom of page 178. A practice is just or fair, then, when it satisfies the principles which those who participate in it could propose to one another for mutual acceptance under the aforementioned circumstances. Persons engaged in a just or fair practice can face one another openly and support their respective positions, should they appear questionable, by reference to principles which it is reasonable to expect each to accept. So, and f furthermore, we have, we acknowledge, it's just a fact that we acknowledge there really is this duty. Just as we feel, remember W.D. Ross was very insistent there's a duty to keep your promises. And he just says, look, we know this. Everybody knows this. You feel that duty if you break a promise. Now, of course, there are some people who don't feel this. Well, they're psychopaths, essentially. Uh, so Rawls is not saying that everybody um, uh, has this, but, or everybody acknowledges this. There is a sense of fair play. Uh, on page 180, he says, it is uh, for this reason that one speaks of the sense of fair play. Acting fairly requires more than simply being able to follow rules. What is fair must often be felt or perceived, one wants to say. Um, so he says, this is just a fact about uh, humans. Uh, again, he'll qualify this uh, later on as he keeps adapting his theory, but it, it's pretty much a fact about humans that there is this duty and not only is this duty, but we feel it. And furthermore, there has to be this duty, otherwise society isn't going to work. Uh, at various points in his writing, Rawls responds to his criticisms who say, oh, you're being a bit, you're being a bit idealistic. Is there really this duty? Do really, people really feel this way? He says, look, if they don't, we're screwed. If they don't, then societies cannot function. This is a feature that makes society possible, is this uh, duty and sense of fair pay. It's a basic moral notion, uh, as he actually puts it. Um, the duty of fair play stands besides other prima facie duties, there's Ross's phrase, such as fidelity and gratitude. We all feel fidelity, we all feel gr gratitude as a basic moral notion. But it can't be uh, reduced to them. It is distinct. He's a pluralist, like W.D. Ross. Um, and furthermore, he says, the sense of fair play is connected with uh, the recognition of others as persons. On page 182, he draws an analogy with recognition of suffering. The criterion, uh, and this I think is 
uh, purposely sounds like Wittgenstein. The criterion for the recognition of suffering is helping one who suffers. Uh, that is, recognizing suffering in others requires that one, uh, as humans, requires that we help them. Acknowledging the duty of fair play is a necessary part of the criterion for recognizing another as a person with similar interests and feelings as oneself. What it is to recognize humans as other locuses of value that are on a par with you is this duty of fair play. We cannot be people who just say, I'm out for myself the whole time. That just isn't who we are. And you might say, oh yes it is, uh, in which point Rawls would call you a cynic and say, well then society isn't possible. Um, all right, let's do this fairly quickly. Utilitarian view of justice. The, uh, for the utilitarian, justice is, um, a just society is one that is organized in a way such that utility is maximized, general happiness is achieved. Now what's wrong with this, uh, and this is Rawls's insight and why the social contract theory must be preferred, is because this is sort of imposed from above. If you don't like your circumstances in a, in a society that utilitarianism says is just, who can you complain to? You can't. It's as if the, the system is imposed from above. That's not a just one. That doesn't recognize that everybody, that a system of justice has to be justifiable to each and every one of us as parties to it. Instead, uh, on the utilitarian model, you're just like the recipients of charity. Uh, you know, you can't complain, you're getting good stuff. It's not in your hands, it's not up to you. Again, we are reminded of Sidgwick's um, view that the justification for ethics should be hidden from the general public. Um, Rawls is very much opposed to that. Everything should be uh, in the open. It's an open process and the, the principles of justice must result from a system that acknowledges, that takes everybody into an account. So uh, what's wrong with the utilitarian is it's sort of opposed from above. And furthermore, um, each human is just seen as a kind of uh, vessel of, of um, welfare. So uh, utilitarians just tot up the total amount of happiness and the only way that they regard a human being is as a number, the units of happiness they uh, express. They ignore the moral history of each one, the relationship between each one. So they ignore the relationships that exist between people. Uh, and this is part of a major criticism of utilitarianism. Um, whereas the social contract uh, acknowledges that we have duties to one another, that we're all part of this system that we're contributing to. The slavery case study, an extended example in Rawls, amazing. Uh, again, he says the mistake that utilitarianism makes is saying that it is possible in theory, even though if not in practice, you know, he says, I don't know any utilitarians who justify slavery, but their theory uh, op leaves open the possibility that there are, are slaveries that, uh, slave systems that could be justified if they happen to maximize happiness. And he says, um, uh, so where I, so if we think of slavery as unjust, then uh, a slave society justified by utilitarianism would say, well, justice is less important in this instance. And as he says on page 189, here again I wish to argue that reasons of justice have a special weight for which only the conception of justice as fairness, using the social contract model, uh, can account. Moreover, it belongs to the concept of justice that they do have this special weight. The special weight um, is uh, is explained by uh, justice as fairness on page 190. He says, uh, uh, it is never an excuse for slavery that it is sufficiently advantageous to the slaveholder to outweigh the disadvantages to the slave and to society. A person who argues in this way is, is guilty of a moral fallacy. 
there is disorder in his conception of the ranking of moral principles. That is, justice comes first. There is a primacy to notions of justice prior even to notions of welfare. That is, you cannot justify a slave society by saying, look, uh, in general, this society is better off. Now, you can see in, in, this, uh, in this criticism the germs of a criticism of the United States today. Because what is a justification of the United States? It's the wealthiest country in the world. So yes, there are great inequalities. Elon Musk owns more than 50% you know, of the population. But hey, look, uh, it's the richest country on earth. Rawls would say, no, that's a, a moral fallacy to argue that way. You can't say the benefit to Elon Musk justifies this system. Um, it has to be, uh, uh, he says, um, the summary. Uh, the principles of justice have an absolute weight. In this sense, they are not contingent, and this is why their force is greater than can be accounted for by the general presumption of the effectiveness in the utilitarian sense of practices that in fact satisfy them. Uh, finally, the concept of justice versus scope or conception. Concept of justice, remember, is just basically this, the idea of justice. And he says every society, every peoples can have, uh, can sign on to the concept of justice. Um, because to exist as a society, you have to have a concept of justice because a society is one where there is a common good, where people are working together. Um, so now their, their views of how to flesh out what is in fact in these circumstances just will vary. Uh, he says at the bottom of page 193, now every people may be supposed to have the concept of justice. Uh, since in the life of every society there must be at least some relations in which the parties consider themselves to be circumstanced and related as the concept of justice as fairness requires. Societies will differ from one another, not in having or failing to have this notion, but in the range of cases to which they apply. So, for example, um, he might say that justice should not be implied within the family. And in one society might say, yes, we have to have a... Uh, even families cannot be patriarchal or cannot, uh, they have to be egalitarian. And uh, in fact, some critics of rules, uh, like Susan Moller Okin, argued that this should be the case that uh, a society that was just according to rules uh, would allow great injustice in the family, which would be an engine for injustice elsewhere because people are being raised to be patriarchal. So Susan Moller Okin would probably think of homeschooling as a bad, Christian homeschooling as a bad idea because it would allow, even though rules might allow it, um, because it would allow little factories of patriarchy to exist within the family. So there's a whole hell of a lot going on in this one article that is going to only expand and expand and expand. I've just given you a taste of it. Um, as a young graduate student, I found Rawls exasperating for the very features that now I realize make him great, that he, is, he has a vision that is so all-encompassing and he's trying to balance things uh, that his critics, you know, critics focus on one area and he can't uh, while ignoring the effect that their criticisms would have elsewhere, whereas he's thinking of everything all at once. And that's his genius. Is the, that's his genius and that's what makes him very hard to read, is that the picture is so uh, wide and all-encompassing. There you go.